To make the case for Canadian film, it's important to know what's what. Canadian filmmakers work in a system that is specifically designed to help them succeed. So how do filmmakers fund their films? Canada's feature film funding system builds its movies on a three-legged stool model. The first leg is direct funding from the government, such as Telefilm or provincial production funds. The second leg is labour tax credits that reduce the cost of employing cast and crew. The third is the market, distributors and broadcasters who pay licence fees for Canadian or international rights. More than 100 feature films get made each year, but how do these films get to audiences? That brings us to distribution. Canadian distributors buy the media rights from Canadian producers before the film is made, which helps complete the finance plan and gives other investors, like Telefilm, confidence that the movie will be marketed and made available to cinemas, streaming platforms, broadcasters, schools, and airplanes in a professional way. Unlike in broadcasting, where broadcasters are required to make about one-third of their content homegrown, there are no quotas for Canadian content in cinema, and most movies that are seen here are from Hollywood. Only about 10% are independent, of which 5% are international independent cinema, and the other 5% are from Quebec and the rest of Canada. Canada's independent movie distributors are the ones that bring that 10% of non-Hollywood films to the Canadian market. This is the system that has existed since before the use of the internet and is governed by the Broadcast Act. The Broadcast Act was last updated in 1991. While the world changed around us, Canadian cultural policy stayed focused on broadcasters until now. Bill C-10 is a proposal to modernize the Broadcast Act. It will define the powers given to the CRTC who manage the nitty gritty of licensed terms for broadcasters, like CTV, CBC, Global and Rogers, and how to license the streamers such as Amazon Video, Netflix, Crave, and Hulu to level the playing field. Also, for the first time, the Act proposes to require programming that reflects the viewpoints of Indigenous people and all of Canada's many and diverse communities. Online streaming has disrupted the distribution landscape for film, blurring the lines between broadcast and theatrical distribution, creating a unique niche in between the two. As this legislation is developed, we believe it's important to consider feature-length film in the mix. So what should the future look like for cinema? And how can we make sure that the new rules benefit a more inclusive, competitive industry? Bonjour, hi, my name is Claudia Hubert. I'll be your host today for this third panel of the Making the Case for Canadian Cinema uh, Symposium. Today we will discuss Canadian film industry and the sustainability of the careers for those who make it. Because when you work behind or before the camera, there might be a temptation at some point to go try your luck on the international market. Maybe do a few projects abroad in the United States, maybe answer the call of Hollywood, and it makes you wonder, should I stay or should I go? And that's the question I'll ask my guest today, starting with Michael Gray Eyes. He's in Toronto, joining us in Toronto. Actor, choreographer, director, educator, founding artistic director of Signal Theater. He is Nehiao of Muskeg Lake Cree Nation in Saskatchewan. And we saw him in films, American films like Woman Walks Ahead, the series True Detective, I Know This Much Is True, Fear of the Walking Dead. And very recently, he received the Canadian Screen Award for Best Actor for his performance in Jeff Barnaby's Blood Quantum, fantastic zombie film. Also with us from LA, we have Tanya Williams, actress. She's been in LA for a few decades. She had a role for years in The Young and the Restless. She is a founder and executive director of Real, Real World Screen Institute and Real World Film Festival. A Real World was created to serve Canadian Indigenous, Black and people of color in the screen-based sectors by providing platforms to develop, to showcase 
emerging talents. We also have Jade Asuné. Jade grew up in Montreal, had his big break in the fantasy series Shadow Hunters, and many roles in Hollywood and Toronto. Now he's acting in Quebec in a series called Alerte. He is also a musician, released his first EP last year, Love Letter to a Fandom. And finally, writer and director Emma Seligman uh, joining us in San Francisco. Her first feature, Shiva Baby, was released this year. It was shot in New York with American actors. Uh, she's been based in the U.S. for the past few years as well. So first of all, I want to get to know you all a bit better and understand the, the trajectory of your careers. Um, and I'll start with Michael, because your first calling wasn't acting, it was dance. You were dancing in Toronto for years before turning to acting. Um, what happened? Why dance and then why acting? Uh -huh. Well, I'm from Saskatchewan. I'm from Treaty 6 originally. And um, I was dancing recreationally and uh, the National Ballet of Canada based in Toronto. I was holding national auditions and my sister on a whim decided to uh, send in our names and I was accepted, um, much to my sister's chagrin. Uh, and we moved uh, my entire family to uh, Scarborough where I grew up while attending the school. And I danced in Toronto for a number of years before moving to New York City uh, to dance with Elliot Feld. And um, it was after I danced with Elliot for a number of years that I became interested in cinema and I began very slowly in Toronto uh, to uh, you know, find my footing in the theater community and also in film. So right away in the dance career, there was a calling from the States as you went to dance in New York City. Why did you make the, the, the jump from Toronto to New York uh, in the first place? Well, you know, of course, New York is a, is a major center for dance uh, across the globe. So um, uh, Karen Kane, uh, who was dancing at the time, uh, suggested Elliot as a choreographer that I should ex I should you know investigate, and uh, I went down to New York City and I auditioned for his company and uh, he hired me. So um, right away, uh, you know there was an international um, aspect to my career. Uh, as a as a Cree person, uh, um, uh, a Native person, I am able to work in the United States without uh, needing a green card uh, because of a J Treaty and other immigration law. So um, crossing the border for work is uh, relatively easy uh, for some uh, Native people. So when you started acting, it was right away with, with American projects or were you doing going back and forth across the, the border? Well, my first gigs, um, uh, what, my first gig was an American gig uh, for uh, TNT television. And then while I was on, on set, I sent in a self tape, an early, early self tape um, for Dance Me Outside, which was a Canadian feature. So in my first year, there was a good example of what will happen to me, I guess, for the latter part of my career. I work in the US and I work in the, in the States. I mean, uh, in Canada. Uh, Tanya, you studied acting at Ryerson in Toronto, and it, it didn't take long before you go, before you, you left for, for the States, for California. Uh, what, why, why that jump early on in your career? Um, well, I didn't actually even arrive in Canada till I was 12 years old. So I think, and I was coming from the, from England. Um, I think when, um, I think if you're born in one place, maybe that change seems more drastic, but traveling already was something uh, that I did. And actually when I started at Ryerson, I was already working as an actor. <laughs> so I actually had to put my acting on hold to take the program because you weren't allowed to work while you were in the program. Um, and then when I went back to it, it was a good while though. I, I started the program, I think in the late seventies, I didn't really move to Los Angeles till 87. So I had put in a good five, six years in Toronto. And I was, I thought what was funny is everybody was always saying how I was booking all the jobs and I was barely making a living. Mm. So the opportunities were so small. I think when you know if I'm booking all the jobs and I can't make a living, that this is, you know, it, it's, um, it was too difficult. We're talking, this is the mid 80s. Things were really exploding in America. Um, the Cosby show, a lot of black shows were happening and nothing like that was happening on the Canadian side. So the move actually happened because I was doing a Disney film in Toronto and that producer said, you should go to the States. And um, he and his wife had a production company there and they actually made a call to an agent 
there and I went down and met with that agency and um, it was right at the time that I had just gotten my H1 um, visa because a lot of Canadians were getting it at that time. I don't even, it's not even an H1 visa anymore. Who knows what, what letter it is now? <laughs> but, but I started going back and forth. But pretty soon you realize you have to really base yourself in the States. They start to think that Canadians are very fickle. If you're, you're kind of there and then you're gone and you're there and then you're, and, and you're gone. So I think those were the scariest first two years because I had to be turning down work in Canada and it wasn't like mm. it wasn't that much but to, to prove that I was serious about staying in and the trust States. the process trust that it would work over there yeah, or at least trust the gamble yeah <laughs> you know, fully and how long was it before you booked uh, the young and the restless a role you you played for what 10 years yeah so I arrived in Los Angeles in 87 and then I did a number of tv commercials while I was being rejected for television shows <laughs> Um, I did some guest spots on sitcoms, but then in 1990, the audition came up for Young and the Restless, and my agents just did not want me to do that, because when you're Black at that time, and even now, sitcoms is where all the money is, and that was where my experience was, but I was so tired of doing sitcoms, I just, I just really couldn't see that I wanted to do that, um, just continually do that, so yeah, I fought to be on the show, even though my agents didn't want me to. Um, and 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 then yeah, in 1990, I I booked that job, and it kind of just changed they, everything for me. They wrote it for you. That's the crazy thing I, I heard. Because I because you know it, it's interesting because you're black. People assume that sort of especially at that time in the states, like all black people had to sound and be a certain way. Um, and I was really fighting against that. So every time I would go to these auditions, and I knew what they wanted. They wanted real like urban from the projects. Yeah. whatever it was they were looking for I would for a stereotype not, yeah in a stereotype absolutely and I would just not do that I'm sure they were like poor girl she can't act <laughs> she doesn't know she can't be black <laughs> when she needs to be um so I went on audition for you know it was your typical stereotypical role where it was she was like a girl on the streets no education illiterate whatever but I did not read it the way they wanted to and so yeah the the show called me back a week later and I was like, they couldn't possibly want me back for this role that I knew I did not do the way they wanted. But they wrote a character that was, she was a doctor. I think 87 was the beginning of people really wanting to make those changes and wanting to show a little bit of different representation. And so I just happened to be at the right time in the right place and, and for that to explode because that character got so much attention from the black community because they were not seeing positive role models of themselves on mm. television. Um, and not just here because even when I would go to France and I would go to Europe and other countries, Young and the Restless was the only positive black representation show <laughs> even in Europe. <laughs> so, and that show it, was everywhere. It was, it was, it was and, really everywhere. It was in 96 markets. So it, it really just blew up everything. Yeah. Um, I remember being at Cannes one year with a, a filmmaker that was a very you know, successful indie filmmaker who could care less about soap operas. And while we were walking down the, in the closet, people were like, Olivia, Olivia, Olivia. <laughs> like, what are those people talking about? <laughs> and they were all the people who worked at Cannes, by the way. They weren't the people who were, in, you know, the filmmakers. They were the workers at Cannes. They yeah. are the biggest soap opera fans. So, uh, uh, right place at the right time. I want to uh, turn to Jade. Grew up in Montreal, Lebanese origins, French speaking. And then at some point you think, I'm going to study acting in English. And it paid off because you started your <laughs> career in, in English with Shadowhunters. I, I it's your did. big break. Um, how lucky is that? <laughs> it's, uh, it was a very interesting journey, you know. Uh, I didn't know when I went to study theater that in Montreal there was two industries. I thought it was all together. I'm like, I speak French, I speak English, I'm good. And then uh, it put me in the English market, so I started working in English, which I did for 10 years until this year. This year was my first role in French ever. And I got a lead on a Quebec series, which is a really uh, lucky and perfect timing thing because of lockdowns and everything. And uh, I was back in Montreal. And I love that it's the reverse process. It's not starting from home and then leaving. You started <laughs> and then you come back home. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, it's some, you know, it's something that my agent first told me. I think the first meeting we ever had, 
she said, because I asked her, I'm like, should I go? Should I go to LA? Should I leave? You know, I, I have all these dreams. I want to do all these things. And, and she said, you know what? If you're talented, they will find you. So she's like, mm -hmm. stay here, do your thing, and they'll find you. And she was right, because I, I worked early on uh, for Disney. I, I got a, that was one of my first things. I got a movie. But, you know, a lot of stuff is shot here in Montreal. So I got a supporting role in that. And then I got another film that brought me to Brussels. Uh, little roles, you know, but but mm -hmm. but they were all kind of happening here. And then when I went to Toronto to do the CFC program, um, that's when I did Shadow Hunters because it was shooting there. So I don't know. I was again in the right place. Obviously, it's a lot of work, and 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 you never know what's coming and how it's going to happen or where you should be. I'm back. I'm back in this place. You know, I'm so happy about this panel because it's like inspiring me to to sort of reorient myself and, and, and figure out what I'm doing. Because right uh, now, are you back in Montreal? Are you in Toronto? Yeah, You're in I'm Montreal. Back in, yeah, I'm back in Montreal. Like I see right. reverse process coming back to Montreal doing French shows. Um, <laughs> but, but I'm thinking of what Tanya just said, where she, when mm -hmm. she said at some point you have to make the move and be there um, maybe in LA to, to do, do those auditions and book those jobs. Is there that yeah. little tug of war inside of you thinking, Absolutely. Do I want to really get into the French speaking francophone Montreal market, maybe France, I don't know, or do I make it for the States? Is there this, this conflict inside of you right now? Yeah, yeah, there is. And I'm even doing music right now. I'm doing music in French, which I just started, but things are happening. Like my music's on the radio and, I'm, and I started to ex export it in France. So it's starting to play on the radio in France. Um, so I, you know, it's, it's funny because I made choices in the last couple of years where I could have gone to LA because when Shadowhunters premiered, the production wouldn't get me there because I'm Canadian, you know? They didn't care. They wanted their cast and everyone else that's Canadian. Well, too bad, even though you're a regular or whatever, it doesn't matter, like we don't bring you. So I just, I invested all my stuff to be there, join the cast, make it to the premiere, be present. And it paid off because then I started traveling the world to meet the fans of the series because I was present and I made myself visible. Um, but I did not move there. I like, I went to LA so many times in the last three years, but I didn't actually make the move. I, I wanted to make music and I don't know. I, um, I, I don't really know what to say. It depends what the person wants right yeah. at that moment. And for me, it was just, come back to Montreal, I'll focus on my art and my music. And I knew the roles would come eventually, you know, but I've seen so many of my friends go and, and I'm glad they did. And, and, you know, it pays off and, and I want dancers to ask a as question. well. Dance. Yep. I want to ask uh, Michael as well, because you teach in Toronto at York University, you have your, your company signal theater, so how do you keep a place that is home and still have projects in the States? How's the back and forth? And did you have at some point to commit to a different city, a different country? Uh, yeah, I was faced with that decision many times, but I never uh, chose to live in Los Angeles. Um, I would stay in Los Angeles while I was working or uh, back in the day when we had pilot season, you know, I would come to Los Angeles, put myself up in a, you know, the Hollywood Gardens or wherever, wherever you know, <laughs> um, and and audition. Um, but then, you know, I'd book work and it would be in Texas or Florida or wherever. So uh, there was never a desire to sort of maintain a, a year round residence. Um, and uh, I'm still based in Toronto. I'm still based in Canada. Um, certainly the position at York uh, solidified that. Uh, but even in the past five years, as I've not been teaching, um, uh, the majority of my work comes from the United States. Um, the auditions happen in the United States. Um, and the work that I do in Canada, I mean, I, I rarely do work in Canada. Uh, I think come about because of the visibility that I've built in the US. Uh, so despite not living there, I end up working there a lot. Turning to Emma Seligman, writer, director, like I said, first feature. Um, so you're Canadian, but you've been in the States for a few years. Is it school that, that brought you to New York in the first place? 
Yeah, I went to film school there for my undergraduate uh, degree, and then I I stayed and I uh, got my O1 visa. Um, and after that process, I felt like I I kind of I wanted to stay, but I felt like I had to stay because I fought so hard to. The application was so grueling, um, and I had um, made such a network of friends from film school that I wanted to make work with. And your first film, actually, it was a, it was a short film first, Shiva Baby. Uh, I think you made for school at NYU. Um, it's it's one day for this college student attending the reception after a, a Jew, Jewish funeral service, and there she will cross paths with her ex girlfriend and her sugar daddy and awkwardness and shoes and shoes. I loved it. Um, <laughs> so because you started the process with the short film at school in New York, it was natural for you to continue towards the, the feature still in the US, still in New York. Did you ever think of let's, yeah, let's, let's go back I to Toronto, think... let's say to do it? Yeah, I debated um, I apologize because I think my internet is a little unstable, but I debated um, doing it in the US or Canada. I sort of thought um, I'll wait to see what my visa process, like what my, the decision is if I can stay in the States or not. And I was working with friends from my program who were producing it with me. It was all of our first time making a feature. Um, and I just sort of said, if we don't, if I don't get my visa, then I'll go to I'll go back to Canada and I'll try to make it there. But I hadn't established a network of friends. I had not worked in the Toronto film industry at all, you know, on set or on in any sort of way. Um, so when I I was I was happy when I got my visa because I sort of thought it would take longer to establish that network and then make the film. But I did think about it quite a bit and I did research into sort of who I would work with or try to figure it out with um, preemptively just in case I didn't get my visa. And was money a factor also in financing the film? Was it easier in the in the States or what, was there a Canadian incentive? Um, how was money influencing your decision? Um, I think money is hard to raise or find no matter where you're making your, your films, especially if it's your first feature. Um, I think that the American process of just being on your own and not having any sort of grant system, government funding, supporting the arts, like makes everyone sort of like a lone wolf, just trying to like attack what's out there. So I don't think that the US necessarily gave me more money to work with or anything, but I think it put the, gave me the attitude and the perspective of just like finding it wherever I could and being really, really, aggressive, which as a Canadian, and as a woman, doesn't come naturally to me to just like, you know, put myself out there and pitch myself and say, like, you're going to get your money back. And this is why I'm going to be successful. And this film is going to be such a success. Um, so I feel like I had to learn how to um, take on that attitude. So I don't, it, the money didn't literally come, come easier in the States, but I think having that attitude made it easier. And that's actually a question I want to ask the, the public, people watching right now this panel. We also want to hear from you. So there's a survey uh, you can fill where we ask, do you think money is a main, the main motivator for Canadian talents to leave the Canadian film industry and maybe try their luck elsewhere? And I'm going to ask also, uh, Tanya, you were saying earlier, uh, you felt like people felt like you booked everything, but you were barely surviving in the Canadian industry when you started. So for you, Tanya, was the, was the paycheck worth it leaving? I'm sure living in LA is much more expensive, but I guess there was a, a financial decision as well. Yes, um, you know, it depends where you are. It's great that you have this particular panel because we're also very different in very different age groups, very different you know, racial diversity, gender. It's also very different. Um, I would say, it's still a good decision if you're black to incorporate the US. You know, it's a it's a big part. We don't we don't have the Will Smiths, the Oprah Winfrey's, we don't have um, the Tyler Perry's, we don't have studios being built and Hollywood really rec recognizing the importance of black talent internationally and the kind of money that they can make. Um, we don't have that yet in Canada. So it really depends also 
I love what Emma was saying. It's where you've built your relationships. So if you end up going to school in the States, a lot of people you go to school with are the people that you kind of continue with. As you grow, they grow and you kind of help each other. Um, so yeah, money, money was definitely um, a factor. I was making, I was certainly making a living <laughs> in Canada, but I was also seeing a lot of people where the, the, um, the length, the, um, um, their, their career lifespan felt shorter mm -hmm. <laughs> in Canada. And, and the limits. Was, it was limited. And while I was young and attractive still, I wanted to take full advantage <laughs> of that because I just saw so many people supplementing their income with working other jobs and doing other things that they weren't satisfied doing. And I knew that I did not want that to be. So I'm very pragmatic in that way. You know, I have this artistic side, but I have a very pragmatic side. So my time, it was, I told you how my agents really didn't want me to take the soap opera, but for me, the soap opera got me my green card. So I'm thinking in very pragmatic ways. Um, it enabled me to buy a house, put savings away so that by the time I was in my forties, I could pretty much walk away and say, I can do whatever I want to do now. I wasn't sitting with millions, but I was certainly sitting where I'm not going to be homeless on the street. I am comfortable. Now, what do I want to do? And I think me creating like the platform of real world, it afforded me to be able to have those options and choices. I don't feel that would have happened for me if I had stayed in Canada at that time. Jade, do you feel that starting your career with bigger projects maybe gave you a financial net that now you can take a step back and <laughs> think of the projects um, and the music you want to do? I, it allowed me to do a lot of good things, but I had to fight a lot because I was not treated the same and because I was Canadian. So that was very difficult to, um, to keep confident you know when they wanted you to know that you weren't as worth as much as the americans or the uk people or the australians you know so that's very hard for for an artist i think you know to um to feel worthy as as you're surrounded by others and you're doing the same thing but you're just not worth as much it's just mm -hmm. such a mental weird thing so i had to um i had to I had to get over that and sort of push through and, and it, it opened a lot of doors, you know, I, I mean, I invested the money I made into my career and into my trips to LA and into, uh, into, into all that, you know, if I had a meeting with a producer, I would just like go to LA, you know, I would just, I wouldn't think twice, yeah. but I wish I had done things differently. This is like the theme of my, of my week is I'm looking back and, um, I mean, everybody's telling me, just look forward, look forward. But, but I didn't do, I, like, I didn't set myself up to be, to be good. And now I, I still have to, I still have to continue and, 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 and create that safety for me or that, because now I'm starting to ask myself, like, am I going to do this forever? You know, like, mm. is this what I want to do forever, forever audition and forever, like prove to someone that I'm worth to be in their show. You know, like, these are questions I'm starting to ask myself, but Yes, it allowed me to create a lot of, you know, my music and a lot of other things that I'm interested in that do fill me up with, with the strength and the power and the creative force I need to continue this career that's so strange. Yeah. Michael, did you feel that, that in the U.S. there's the, 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 the Canadian difference, maybe the Cree difference? Did you feel that you had to fight a bit more to, to make a mark and maybe for salaries or, you know? just respect is that um was there a clash i you know i don't uh it, my my experience has to be lensed through the fact that i'm indigenous so already um hollywood was looking at my employability um within a very narrow frame of reference like um it was until i did v wars which was a netflix series that i did about two years ago um that's about 28 years into an acting career where I'd been cast um, as a, you know, as an FBI agent, not a native FBI. Yeah. So you have to understand that, that my experience has really been um, dominated by that idea that, that I couldn't just play something uh, that I had to, that it had to be a native something. Right. Um, but I didn't find uh, necessarily that, uh, 
uh, I was paid less or, you know, I, I had very good representation. So, you know, they would always fight for me. And in the era when I was coming up, they, they still had a quote system. So there was this opportunity, which, you know, if you worked enough, you could sort of build your way forward. Um, but then uh, that model changed, uh, the California law changed, um, the industry changed a bit uh, in that, uh, you know, they would always cry poor. We're like, oh, we just don't have the money. You know, everything is favored nations, you know. And then, and then that company would then make a film and it'd be low budget or whatever. And then Sony would buy it or whomever, right? And then all of a sudden, you know, you're like, oh, they have all this money now. Um, I do find that uh, there is um, uh, a really stark difference uh, when you work in Canada uh, in terms of who has access to what kind of roles. Um, I've worked on a couple of series in Canada, uh, Home Before Dark, uh, you know, V Wars, uh, another one um, that's coming out soon. The stars of the of the series that are filmed in Canada are usually American actors or, or international actors. Um, and Canadians populate the sort of background secondary roles, which is what I did um, also as a Canadian. Uh, and that's, I think, a unique situation. Uh, the Canadian industry is very happy to have the, the work here because crews are Canadian. Um, lots of Canadian actors can find work. But I find it's interesting that it's, it's very rare when uh, these shows uh, would choose a Canadian uh, to be the lead. Um, so there is a real disparity in, in how our employability looks. It's interesting because I know very well the Quebec side and Jade knows it too. And in Quebec, we have this star system and the, the cinema is really made for people here and exported a bit in Europe and Francophone country, but it's very distinct cinema. Do you feel that sometimes Canadian cinema and television disappears into the American culture. That's a, that's a bit what you say. Is it Canadian show or Canadian film? At some point, the, the line gets blurred and, and we favor maybe American actors and directors and we don't um, take care enough maybe of our industry? Hmm. I, I guess I, that's, a, that's a complicated question. Um, I find that the work that I've, I've, I've enjoyed the most in Canada uh, comes from my own community, the Indigenous community. Uh, so, for example, one of my first feature films was Dancing Outside, and although it was a you know a intercultural project, uh, it featured Native actors. Um, Blood Quantum, you know, uh, Jeff Barnaby's film is a Canadian film. Yeah. Uh, so, I found that within the Indigenous context, um, Canada has done very very well, uh, or I should say the indigenous filmmakers and producers and writers have done very well. At and especially recently, Canada. so many great projects in the last few years, we see a rise of voices in the indigenous community for sure. For um, sure. For sure. But if I ask um, uh, 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 Jade, do you see a difference when, when you leave Quebec? Canadian projects in English or American projects, for you, is the, is the distinction a bit blurred or is it very different? Um, well, my experience is is that the system is made so that it's like, and and I I don't know I've had a kind of a, it's my experience is a bit tainted because it, it it was very like, Canadians have their place and Americans have their place you know it was kind of like that and I didn't want to be I didn't want to think like that I wanted to 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 be one of the ones included in all that you know and uh, but that's um that's how it feels to me. I feel like our industry is kind of built um, to give room for the United States. And I think the business side of it is happy and the financial side of it is like happy to be that way, but the artists aren't because we want to push through. And a lot of artists and directors and, and people creating stuff, they are pushing through and they're creating amazing content. But I mean, in the system of like, you know, a lot of the studios are rented for, for American shows or, or, or films and, and Canadian stuff kind of, I don't know, it gets diluted a little bit. That's, that's what I feel. Earlier, I think it's Tanya who said something about the, the people around us uh, when we're in school and we keep meeting them and, and it becomes a bit of a family. And I'm thinking about um, Emma uh, staying in, in, in the US to do her film. I remember in film school, the first thing I was ever told is, look around you, the people around the table, 
are the people you will make films with. Um, so you have that little tribe around you to make your first film, but is there maybe that desire to at some point come back to Canada or for you, you feel that you're, you're, you're too rooted with your people and your group of, of fellow filmmakers to make the move back? No, I definitely want to come back to Canada and make, um, uh, tell Canadian stories. So I think where it's applicable to make, you know, to tell Canadian stories, it makes sense to make them within the Canadian framework and business. I, it's not one that I have experience in though. So who knows what will happen if I don't like it or, you know, if I have complications with it or it's, it's not what I'm used to, um, I, you know, but then but can I, I ask I you, what would be try. a Canadian story when you say I want to go back to Canada and do Canadian story? What is that to you? How is it different? Uh, films that take place, films that take place in Canada. Um, I mean, I'm certain there's, I'm sure there's, there's stories that can take place anywhere, but I think geography is really important to me. Um, and most of the stories that I would like to tell are, are told within a specific setting that I'm from or have lived in and, and have experience in. And, uh, who knows there could be films that I, I pitch on that I end up directing that have a you know uh, a sort of uh, you know a location that could be filmed anywhere but uh, I think that it's an active choice it seems like from the sort of conversations that I've had with Canadian filmmakers and Canadian production companies if I wanted to make something within the Canadian system it's sort of a choice to leave the system that I'm used to but I've only made one feature film so you know, I feel lucky that I, I have representation now in the US and um, I am starting to understand the system here. However, my film was made completely independently. It wasn't, I felt almost like it wasn't really made within a system because my friends and I raised the money on her on our own. And um, I think we could have done that anywhere, even though it's sort of, like I said, with an American attitude. Um, but I don't feel, I would like to make movies with many different people. So I don't feel tied to the friends that I, I made Shiva Baby with, although, you know, I would like to continue working with them again and again. Um, but uh, no, I, I definitely, for yeah, if I, there's stories that I would like to tell that take place, you know, in Toronto or in Canada. And I think that, um, you know, it's a goal of mine to be able to come back and tell those stories, um, you know, there, not, and not just with an American production company shooting there, but you know, within the framework of the Canadian but system. Your film did really well in, in festivals. And yes, it's opening doors for you. you. You're still like in the process to find out which doors and how. But, um, but do you think that the fact that you had American actors that we recognize, that it helped, that it gave that extra push, that if you had taken Canadian actors are not as well known and recognized easily, um, do you feel that that American angle gave you an extra push? Definitely. Yeah. hundred <laughs> percent. I, uh, I think, uh, but also, you know, a lot of it, uh, yeah, I think a lot of it was about name rec 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 recognition. Um, my God, I can't speak. Um, I think, uh, you know, but a lot of it was also specific. We made the movie for very little money. A lot of us weren't paid and it was, we needed the actors to be local to New York. Um, we needed them to be able to take the subway to get to set because we couldn't afford to pick them up. Um, and all of them were just down to make an indie in the summer. And basically, you know, their, their daily, the SAG rate, which was micro budget. So it was scale afforded Ubers there and back for them and if they didn't want to take the subway. Um, so, I mean, if they're, I don't know, like it's tough. I think, you know, that's sort of a cop-out answer because it really was about name recognition. Um, but it was, it, it wasn't like we had the chance to like cast from a pool of actors and, decide like who we wanted and audition people we offered the roles to people and um you know it was a it was about convenience and recognition and who was right for the role etc there's a second question i want to ask uh, the uh, the audience people watching this panel um if they think if you think uh, at home that the Canadian film industry does it allow enough creative diversity uh for actors for directors is it a creative uh, soil in Canada to make films. Uh, what do you think, Emma? Um, do you think that if you had to come back to Canada and maybe apply to different programs, do you think you would have made the films you made as an indie freely in the States? Like, do you feel that you were freer maybe? 
Definitely. Yeah. But I think we were freer because we didn't have anybody. We didn't have any production companies. We didn't have any studios. So, you know, I think that if we were so, you know, we, we tried to make it with the help of more experienced people, whether they be at a production company or where they were professional financiers. And I'm sure if that we had done that, you know, we would have felt obligated to appease them in different ways, whether it be through casting or in script changes or in, in the crew, et cetera. Um, so I feel like we were on an island, like, you know, because we, it's not even we decided to, you know, raise the money independently. We just sort of had to. Um, and it was like a yes or, you know, it was like, this is happening or, or you know, uh, there's no way this isn't happening. We put like a sort of time bomb on it. We said it has to happen this summer. It's never gonna happen. Um, so, I mean, I don't really know. I think any sort of system guides you through, like has restrictions on who you can cast or what you can do. I, I don't have experience with yeah. telefilm, et cetera. So I'm not sure what that process is like, but I'm sure that anyone that's giving you money has opinions um, and rules about, you know, what you have to do in order for them to give you money. Uh, Tanya, in your experience, what do you think about the, the creative liberty? Do you feel that maybe Hollywood has this very Hollywoodian system and, and sometimes they really want to do films uh, almost by, paint by number? <laughs> or, or like, where do you feel the creativity is, is uh, more free in the States well, or in Canada? Well, you know, um... I don't know. That kind of freedom is really an internal thing. It's not even really an external thing from what other people are doing or what other decisions are being made. Um, Los Angeles, Hollywood is about making money. And if they can make it money in an, a totally indie film, um, you know, where a horror movie where a camera is just left on the ground and kids are screaming and all kinds of things are happening, but it's making big dollars, they'll do that. And if it's, if it's an Avenger, Avengers you know, with a, from a comic book, they'll do what makes um, money. But going back to something you were saying before that I feel very strongly about too, it's not always Americans sort of taking advantage of Canadians. Canadians allow themselves to be taken advantage of. Mm -hmm. There are things that agents just allow their, their talent to do in Canada that agents in America just would say no. And I think the Americans have gotten used to the fact that agents just kind of go along you know, whatever you say, they're shocked. They'd say to me all the time, I can't believe I suggested that. And they were like, yeah. So when Jade is saying something like, I didn't get flung down or the way I was treated, he's treated that way because of how it was negotiated for him. Um, producers here and Hollywood here respect the hard no, you can't have that person. This is what they need. You know, you're going to have to fly them down. This is all put in a contract. And so if on one hand, a Canadian agent is going to be like, yeah, okay, that's fine. We'll take that. We'll do that with, with very little pushback. And of course, in pushback, it means you may lose a gig. But if enough people did it in Canada, eventually Americans would gather around and go, oh, the climate has changed. <laughs> you know, they're not going to just take scale anymore. They want all these other, you know, props that um, happen. And I, and I know it because it's happened to me, you know, I spent my early years working in Canada, but I've done very little working in Canada because my agents will sometimes call and go. And this is just hilarious to me because I don't even know why you would call. He said, there's a job, they really want you. It's in Nova Scotia. Um, they need you to pay your own airfare. And is there anyone you can stay with while you're there? <laughs> and it's just a little under scale. So I will say to him, so basically, if I lose $500, <laughs> I have the privilege of packing all my clothes, getting to LAX, flying for five, six hours and getting there. So I can do two days work, you said, at under <laughs> scale. Let me think about that for a minute. No, like, I don't even know what you would be. Why would you be asking people this? Um, people all the time will say with Hollywood agents or American agents, they'll say, actors don't even hear about those jobs. Like, cause your agent will just go, no. And filter, yeah. Filter all that stuff out. So they become, it ups your value. Um, you can't even get to that actor without passing this gateway. And this gateway is ready to say no to you already. So I think we need to toughen up the, what Emma was saying, um, how she really had to hustle to get her film. I think we need more of that hustle in the States. And if you're gonna go toe to toe with America, 
and you want your talent to, you know, exist on that same play plane, I think you're going to have to hustle a little. And the fact that we don't have the star system is built into that as well. I mean, mm -hmm. we, we need to, I don't know what that is, but even producers in Canada, they don't value the actress in Canada. They'll spend all their money looking for American actors, looking for UK actors, looking for Australian actors, because they feel, they themselves feel, we're not getting the cachet with a Canadian yeah. actor. It devalues who you are. And, uh, and that's something we need to get over internally. And I think actors need to raise up against that too. Michael was horrified uh, at the beginning of what you were saying. You, you had that kind of experience also, Michael, of, of being offered the privilege of paying uh, your own gig. Oh, yeah. I mean, uh, there's, a, there's a point in your career where, you know, at the beginning, you'll sort of go, oh, my gosh, I have a job. I'm so, I'm so excited. But then there comes another, another point where, you know, my agents will just, just say, uh, okay, so that offer was not anywhere near where it needs to be. Yeah. And so if you want this actor, me, um, this is what it's going to take. It's exactly what Tanya had said. And so you just need to have um, a different kind of representation. Just so you know, I have my managers in Los Angeles and uh, my agent is also based in LA. I have Canadian representation, but they work as a team. Mm. So in a way, I, I, uh, I have uh, the best of both worlds. Um, uh, But I think also it's it's really interesting when I'm listening to the conversation um, that the frame of the questions uh, is you know uh, Canada versus the United States or us versus them. Um, I I live in Canada. You know I cheer for you know Canadian athletes at the Olympics, uh, but I look at myself as a citizen of Turtle Island. You know uh, Indigenous people were here you know throughout the Americas. Um, so I look at the opportunities of work, whether it's in Texas, California, or Vancouver, or Toronto, it's, it's just simply work. Uh, why, why would there be a barrier uh, for me artistically and financially? Uh, because money doesn't care about borders. Money will go to where it needs to go. Um, so I look, at, I look at that kind of uh, nationalist, uh, you know, sort of frame and it's it it doesn't make sense to me mm. I, i will work where work will pay me um so I, i think that's my philosophy in terms of where i work and and of course the projects that interest me are ones in which uh indigenous people are empowered and joyful and successful yeah. so it kind of limits the kind of work that does get offered to me uh but uh i think i've enjoyed a certain amount of success with that There is the dream of, of Hollywood, of bigger projects, of the big trailer and, and, and yeah, bigger projects. There's this Hollywood dream. Uh, and Jade, uh, I know that you were a bit disappointed by this world. I heard that at some point it, it was not on a human scale, you felt, I think, um, that you like to come back to more human projects. Yeah, I mean, it's funny because when I was doing Shadowhunters, I was uh, also creating a web series with uh, people in Toronto, very independent. So I had the contrast of like huge multi-million dollar pr project, Disney, Netflix, everything. And then like six people crew shooting a, a thing. And I realized, wow, the satisfaction is, is so different, you know, as a, as a human, as an artist. And uh, it was still fun. It was still as fun to do both, but I just saw the difference. And I saw, started seeing like what really fulfills me and uh what what i like and how i like to be treated and things like that like um like tonya was saying i i said <laughs> i quit the show many times actually i said no many times uh throughout the four seasons so uh luckily they didn't they brought me back you know even after i'd said no But um, yeah, I don't know. I I mean, I still want to do those things. I still want that. It's just I'm not as um, I'm not as desperate as I used to be. Maybe I'm 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 not as like I want this dream because I saw that it's, it's just like a illusion, you mm. know. And real things are the experiences with people and and the experiences on set, and those are the real things. And like a billboard is just like a really big 
you know, poster. It's just a photo printed on a huge paper. And, and that's all it is really, you know, and you look at it and you're like, that's a huge billboard and I'm right here. And that's just the paper. And I'm, you know, it's like these things just made me realize and the way I, I wanted to be treated and all that stuff. So, I mean, I'm still exploring all that. I'm still, um, I'm still discovering, you know, and life's taking me where it's taking me and I'm kind of going with it now and I'm choosing my projects based on if I really want to put my whole soul into it or not. So I'm so still hopefully discovering. for you, the next step is a bit of music, a bit of, a bit of acting in <laughs> Quebec, a bit of acting in English and just navigating yeah. those different spheres in your life. Exactly. I'm back at the point in my life where I don't know what's coming next as we all kind of get to eventually. And, uh, You know, it's scary. It's exciting. Mm. It feels over. You know, it always feels like it's over forever. But um, <laughs> this is making me feel like it's not, you know. <laughs> And <laughs> you're not you alone. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> And Tanya, yeah. what, what's next for you? You're between L.A., Toronto. You have real world. Uh, yeah. What are the But next I, I want to feel it, especially Jade and Emma. I'm 63 this year. It goes up. It goes down. It goes up. Everybody thinks, oh, this is the one opportunity that I missed and there's never going to be another one. It is a completely unrealistic. And um, yeah, right now I'm so focused on the real world platform and not only the festival, we're constantly, we're expanding the year round programs and access real world, which is now the database that has just taken off so much, especially in the last 12 months. But that is so fulfilling for me. But I haven't been, it's not that auditions haven't been there. I've had, I have not had the desire to go on, on an audition, to tell you the truth. And that's almost funny for me to say, because I was that actor, you know, with the clothes in the back of the car and you would <laughs> change wherever you could and be there for the next audition. Um, I just don't feel, I love acting still, but that whole, you know, you just reach an age where that gets tired. I, I, I think it was um, Alfred Wooder uh, in an in interview once turned, she said, I, I knew it when I turned up at this audition, And these two kids were auditioning me <laughs> and, and they were eating a sandwich off my eight by 10 photo <laughs> that was on the table. And she goes, and all I could think of was I need to get my groceries and I had to pick up my kids. And, you know, I <laughs> had to make food for the, the dinner. And I just, she just, I just, I didn't want to be there. And she reached a safe stage where she literally just said only offers. I don't even want to go. And I know people might say, you know, it sounds like, oh, they're being so difficult. They don't want to audition for something. But there are literally things I asked to audition for that is the work that I've done for 40 years. <laughs> it's, not, it's not even a stretch character. It is exactly what I've done for 40 years. You're like, at what point do you just say, would you like to do this part? I could understand if it was something so extreme mm. from what I've ever done, but it is sometimes when it's exactly what you do. I got to tell you, though, something that happened when I was in Toronto, I would go into castings. Um, and this is not, I mean, you know, this is really not putting down people, you know, but I would go in and you really felt like you were intruding on the casting director. You know, they'd be like, oh yeah, sign over there, get this, sit over there, whatever. But when I first arrived in LA and you have to understand I hadn't done anything and nobody knows me. <laughs> and I walked in that first audition. I was like, is this what it's like? Because oh, casting person was like, Oh, yes, who are you, Tiny? Oh, yes, Tiny is so glad that you could come in. Could you come this way? We're just running like a couple of minutes behind. If you could sit right there, bathrooms over there, can I get you a water, whatever? I really felt like I was a superstar <laughs> from just the way she made me feel. And when I went into the audition, I felt like they all knew my name and, and that I had arrived from Canada and the, so glad that you're here. And I, you feel different. I created a different audition Than feeling like, oh, just sit over there and we don't really don't care if you're here or not or whatever. <laughs> and, yeah. And go in and people kind of look up and like, what? Yeah. Oh, okay, go. It makes you feel different. And Michael, after those great roles you had in the States, I'm thinking True Detective, I know this much is true. I'm thinking of this new win for, for Blood Quantum. Um, are, are, are you still in that, that, that um, audition mode we're just describing or are roles coming to you more and more? Uh, well, Uh, I audition. I uh, I I had a film uh, that was in competition at uh, Sundance this year called Wild Indian, which is being released theatrically this fall. Great reviews. Um, that was an offer because the filmmaker really saw me in that role. Uh, but uh, right now I'm doing Rutherford Falls, uh, an American series. Of course, you know I auditioned, screen tested for that. 
Uh, so I don't think I'm at a stage in my life, um, and I auditioned for Blood Quantum, which I won, you know, the award for. So I'm not at that stage where I get a lot of offers, uh, and I'm happy to audition, uh, you know, because at least the the, the work that's coming, um, you know, I know this much is true. You know, Derek C. en France, Mark Ruffalo, these are wonderful, wonderful roles. Uh, and so I'm grateful for the opportunity. And I think as an Indigenous actor, um, I have an obligation to my community, um, uh, the artistic community that I come from, uh, to, you know, be part of uh, projects that have resonance. So I'm, I'm fortunate, you know, I, 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 I'm waiting for my next audition. Emma, what's coming up for you? You're writing, you're, you're in discussion for projects. Where are you at in the next step for your career? Um, I'm in like development at this point for different projects, but it's interesting sort of having this conversation of, of Toronto or Canada versus Hollywood because I didn't make my first film within the Hollywood studio system. So now that I've, uh, you know, been afforded representation and also more work from the success of my first film, now is the beginning of me working within the system um, and writing and developing you know, studio slash network projects. So I haven't experienced that yet. So that is what seems to be the next step for me is, um, you know, uh, making the projects that I've wanted to for a while within this system, within, you know, the funding of the studio system, but then also pitching on projects that aren't my own, um, just to direct or just to write. Um, so um, that's what's next. So I feel like maybe then I'll be able to speak from <laughs> this perspective on the studio side, et cetera, in terms of versus Canada. But, uh, you know, so that's what's next for me. And that's all the time we have today. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you uh, to Michael Gray, to Tanya Williams, Emma Seligman, Jay Desuni. It was such a pleasure to have this conversation with you for this uh, third panel. Uh, thank you to the Canadian Academy of Film and Television for having us. And uh, we want to hear from people at home. So right now you're going to see on the YouTube channel a little survey. Uh, please fill it out so we can uh, hear your opinion on different issues that were raised today or in the past panels. Feel free to join us as well on Reddit, where the discussion is going to continue after this panel. Uh, and hopefully see you soon, maybe in a movie theater. Thank you so much and hope to meet you in person very soon.